it's kind of ironic that I start this with my neighbor's dogs barking. Is your dogs barking driving you around the bend? Feel like you spend half your life wondering how you can just take the edge off those little barks a little. I know none of you are hoping for a silent dog. After all, you don't keep a dog and bark yourself. But fear not, lovely people. Today, I'm going to borrow your attention for one sweet hour to give you some insights into why your dog barks and what you can do about it if it's just a little more than you needed. So just a little bit of a trigger warning if you have a bark sensitive dog, you may want to pause and get out your headphones at this point as there will be barking in this webinar. I will warn you before we move on to any of the videos where there is barking though, I promise. Usually when I start writing content for a webinar, I like to think of the dogs who I've known who exemplify this or that problem. Often I've got case studies that really hit the mark. And today I'm starting with my boy Heston here in the picture, aka King of the Barks. Much like me, Heston was a very vocal individual. I remember his barking definitely popping around out around 10 or 11 weeks. He'd been found as an orphan pup found with his siblings at just a day old. Of the five surviving pups, as they aged, the vet thought that they were Labrador cross collies, not dogs without a bark of their own, of course, but it was only when I had his DNA tested, and I did it twice, um, just to make sure, that he, when he was six, that my eyes really opened. He was mostly shepherd with a tiny bit of Labrador and a tiny bit of Spaniel. And of those two shepherds in his DNA, something I tested with two different companies, he was mostly grown under our Belgian shepherd with a tiny bit of, Bel of German shepherd. And didn't that German shepherd bit manifest in his wonderful barks? So where the Belgians tend to a staccato high pitched affair that's barely worth bothering with when they can be bothered to bark, the German Shepherd bark is definitely one that I'd recognise a mile away. And Heston definitely had inherited the German Shepherd bark there. His biggest and most terrifying bark was definitely the someone is trying to get onto the property bark and the steer clear I'm here bark. Uh, so familiar to many garden, um, German Shepherd guardians, I think. The bark that caused my neighbours to politely remark that I was very well guarded. But he had lots of other barks as well. Firstly, they were ones that, with which I would become very familiar. You know, the first there was the high pitched staccato yip barking rally that whoop, whoop, whoop in the forest that just meant he discovered something very exciting that had probably just taken flight. He also had the this is freaking me out bark, um, the alarm bark stone crosses and unexpectedly coming across his own reflection were definite triggers of that bark and that delightful french habit european habit of putting jesus on the crucifix in surprising places and conspicuous places in towns definitely caused heston to have a few problems and then he had a kind of a get a move on bark of excitement usually when i was tying my shoelaces before a walk or when we pulled up at a popular walking spot He'd got growls that became barks and arousal that became barks and excitement that became barks and joy that became barks. He also had this lovely fanfare, the fanfare bark of just going into the garden bark and that I'm coming into the garden and Emma's following me kind of bark and then a bunch of other barks on top of that as well. So he was definitely a dog who liked the sound of his own voice and enjoyed barking sometimes. He barked at crows, he barked at the moon, he barked sometimes for the sheer pleasure of barking. If you've not met me before, I'm Emma. I'm a dog enthusiast and expert on all things furry, frustrated, furious and four-legged. With six years of experience as a trustee in one of France's largest shelters and 10 years supporting local shelters and rehoming organisations, I'm passionate about the welfare and well-being of dogs and their owners as well. I've lived and worked with woofers, with growlers, with yippers, with barkers, with howlers and with yappers. I also run light and up dog training to help guardians and trainers who live and work with dogs who've got all the big feelings. And I currently live with my all but silent Belgian Malinois, Liddy, who may bark once or twice a year. Um, but I've also lived with some big barkers, including Heston, who you've already met, and Flicker, who the vet described as having broken her bark because you'd used it so much. Uh, before she came to live with me, I should point out. So come and join me on this journey of canine discovery as we dig into the whys and wherefores of our noisy doggos. And I'll let you into some of the secrets about how Heston and Flicker tamed it back a little bit. 
to start, we're going to put on our animal scientist hats, our ethology hats for my own. Nicholas Tinberg and the Dutch ethologist gave us four big questions when it came to the study of animal behaviour. What are the causes of behaviour? So what are the triggers? Another big question he asked was, what's the function of the behaviour? What's the purpose? What does it do? What's it designed to do? Our third big question that we'll be asking about barking is what does its development look like from birth onwards? Like when does it start happening? And also, how does it emerge in the individual? What are the developmental and environmental factors that influence it? I can tell you all of those stories for Heston. And our fourth big question is, what does it look like in other related species? But these are not our only questions. I have so many questions, as always. Even when I think about Heston, I could see that there are actually many different triggers for his many different barks. Sometimes that was a dog or a person passing the property. It could be a car pulling us up outside. It could be an animal or a bird he'd spotted. Stone crosses we've already talked about. Shiny surfaces, Jesus on the cross, that could also startle him and elicit a bark. Having to wait was something of a trigger for barking as well. And we can think about triggers, about needs, about motivations, even thinking about breeding. I've talked about him being partly German Shepherd. Then for all of those different contexts and scenarios, I can also think about the function of the behaviour. What does the behaviour do or what's it designed to do? I mean, in some cases, it's distance increasing, go away barking, but it's not always go away barking. And the fun bit about barking is that some of it doesn't really even seem to have very much of a consequence or a purpose that we can easily see. So for its development, Heston really didn't seem to bark until he was nine or ten weeks or so. And then the trouble started. He'd have some barking tournaments, like a rally of barking with the German Shepherd who lives next door to us. And he'd also bark when he was startled when a neighbour walked in. I remember him barking for at least 20 minutes about a sieve that was precariously positioned in the kitchen. Um, the barking before the walk also started there. Or also if we were in the car and we passed people or cyclists, that also kicked up a notch as well. I also remember that first barking at exciting things when he was about five months old. So thinking about the situations and the context can be really helpful. And we'll be doing a lot of that as we go. It's also really useful to ask some other questions as well. Some of those relate to the individual. Who does the behaviour? What do we know about them? What do we know about this, this animal? What's their role? What is their position in the social relationship? What do we know about their health, their morphology, their physiology, their history, their biology? For instance, my old boy got more sensitive to the world as his health declined and he got older and he started barking more at the world around him. Oh, I do miss that beautiful black face. So we can also ask who or what is the barking directed at? Quite often it was directed at me. When does the barking happen? What immediate triggers are there? How quickly does it happen from seeing or hearing the trigger? How long does a bark, dog bark for? Where does the barking happen? What happens after the barking? So there are so many questions. So if a client rings me and says that they've got a problem with their dog barking, I'm going to ask you all of these questions. That goes without saying. So when we have a behaviour, a context and a target, one thing that then is really helpful to do is break down the question once we know the where, the when and the what. So we get all specific then. So let's look at one example of Heston's barking. So whenever we've got a question such as why does this dog bark at strangers outside the house, we can then prioritise different and specific aspects of that question. Why does this dog bark at strangers outside the house? Why does this dog bark at strangers outside the house? Why does this dog bark at strangers outside the house? Why does this dog bark at strangers outside of the house? Why does this dog, this specific dog, bark at strangers outside of the house? And then finally, we get to the really big one at the end. Why does this dog bark at strangers outside of the house? So all of these questions are just put a little bit of a different priority, a different focus on the behaviour and all things that we can investigate. So when we have these different focuses, we can then start to think, do they only bark at strangers outside the house or do they also bark at strangers in other places too? What about other people's houses if we're in there? What about if they see a stranger on a walk? Does the dog bark in that situation? 
why does the, str the dog bark at strangers outside the house and not familiar people who are outside? Is there a moment when they can't see familiar people and they are barking, but then when they notice it's a familiar person, they stop? Or does the dog recognise signs like it's the car or the way people sound, the way they move before the dog can actually see them? So I had a really interesting case study recently where the dog was barking when the front door opened, but then stopped when he could see who'd arrived and they moved into the door space. So he would bark for as long as they were out in the hallway because he perhaps couldn't see who they were. But that's interesting stuff to kind of work out, even for one tiny situation like this. Asking all of these questions can give us so much information and then we can start to drill down into those things. So, for instance, with the dog who was barking um, when he couldn't see people in the hall, what we noticed is he actually wasn't barking even when the key went in the lock. It was only when the door opened that the barking started. That was the trigger. And the, dog, the barking then stopped when the person came into view. So it was very much about the person coming into the house and not being able to see and identify who that person was and then we could start to put into some things to make it easier for him to know oh I don't need to bark in this situation but it was really interesting to notice that he didn't bark at noises outside of the house or he didn't even seem to bother when people were outside of the house and that it was really in that kind of that intermediate period also what was really interesting is he didn't get off the couch to go and have a look so all of these contextual factors give us really useful information that we can then start to address. And as we move on, we can start to focus on other parts of the statement. We've already talked about the context. Where are they barking? We've talked about the target of that communication. Who are they barking at or what are they barking at? And then we can start to think about other aspects of this question, like the word barking. Why do they bark, for instance, as opposed to growling or howling or doing something like jumping up at the window? We can also think about dogs. Why does the dog bark? Why do dogs bark? That's a big question. That's why probably you're here. But we can also start to think about other canids like jackals, coyotes, dingoes and wolves and think about why being a dog leads to barking rather than meowing, for example. Here we can also ask why do dogs bark at strangers in general? Because quite a lot of them seem to do that. And after that, we can then start to drill down into the specifics of that individual dog. Why does this dog do this? What kind of factors contribute to barking in this dog? Those could be genetic factors. They could also be learning and experience. And finally, we get into the big question, the one we all, we all want answers to. Why does the dog do this? What's the function of barking? What's its purpose? What's the cause? What consequences does it have and what triggers? And all of these are questions that we really need to consider the answers to. And we have so many interesting questions to get through. And sometimes these questions in themselves give us answers or things that we can investigate. We'll look at some other scenarios shortly, but if our dog is only barking at strangers outside the house and not family members and not strangers when we're out on walks or in other situations, then that kind of gives us useful information that might suggest an answer of a sort. Dogs are territorial and a good old bark can warn intruders to steer clear. As my neighbour said, I was very well guarded. So that can be one reason. But you'll also see shortly that wolves also bark, even though many researchers for a long time didn't think that wolves did bark. And that can be to do with proximity to the centre of the territory or the wolf pup's den. So they bark less when they're on the edge of the territory and more in the centre. But that's only one explanation for why the dog is barking on home turf. You know, perhaps there's also the security of being on familiar terrain that gives them more confidence. So we'd have to look at what behaviours we see when they encounter strangers out on walks. So for Heston, for example, he was generally not very interested in people off the property. He was never really a people person. So looking at his behaviour around strangers in the two contexts, like what was he doing on the home turf and what did he do when we were out on walks, that there was clearly a change. Things were different and he was much more likely to bark on home turf than he was to bark when we were out and about. So perhaps being on home turf also reduces your ability to move away or to hide or, you know, leaving dogs with the option of fight rather than flight. So unless we're professional researchers with a team of PhD students at our disposal, which I am not, we probably don't always need the answers to all of these questions to find solutions to our dogs. Interesting those questions might be.
but they do give us information and from that information if we felt like we needed to help our dog then we could understand where they need support and sometimes how that support might look so much of this session is just Emma's interesting facts about barking. It's not making any judgment about whether it's excessive to human ears or it's nuisance barking to human ears. But barking can often be the one thing that causes a dog to be removed from a home. And I've certainly had my own fair share of cases where it was imperative that barking was reduced because otherwise there were judicious rulings in place that judicial, judicious, judicial rulings in place that meant that the dog would either need to be rehomed or euthanized. So noise pollution is the, often the one factor where police or municipal workers can remove a dog in France and prosecute the guardian. So I'm certainly not here to say that barking is bad or it's excessive or to pass judgment on it or even that we should do something about it. Of course, it can be an, uh, an indication of emotional distress, though, in dogs. And in that case, I'd want to reduce that distress and therefore reduce the barking. So it is a timely point, though, to stop and remind ourselves that if we consider our dog's vocalisations, whatever they may be, including barking, to be indicative of problems or it's causing issues with our neighbours, then we really should stop before we start to make changes to consider the ethics of a situation. So, for example, a former client of mine, John, he lived with his three dogs in a small village in France. He'd been persecuted for months by his neighbour, but the neighbour had registered a complaint with the police. The neighbour had documented all the time, so they got that noise diary uh, that the dogs barked, and the police agreed that the dogs were a nuisance. It was a really delicate situation because John was a vulnerable member of the community, and he was being selectively targeted by the neighbour, who actually had his own hounds. Um, so even though I managed to find John some very good legal advice, it didn't change the fact that there was a catalogue of recorded barking and a diary of events stacked up against him and that he risked being taken to court by his neighbours and a possible euthanasia or rehoming of his dogs. I should add at this point, France has got history with this. Noisy frogs have been prosecuted. A cockerel uh, was subject to a lawsuit in rural France. And in both cases, the judge had ordered the owners of said frogs. Can you? own frogs I don't know and the cockroach the owner of the cockroach should reduce the noise so of course unlike dogs where we can bring about behavior change more easily it's actually not that easy to get a cockerel to be quiet so for John even though his dogs were more noisy weren't more noisy in actual fact than anybody else's in the village including the neighbors his their future and his future actually depended on us reducing the barking so with these ethical considerations, sometimes legal considerations in mind, we should always prioritise the welfare and well-being of a dog. That goes without saying. If barking is an indication of negative states of affairs for the dog and negative feelings, perhaps if, especially if those neg manifest frequently, then addressing the basis for those feelings should be our goal. Behaviours such as these, these barking behaviours that show negative states of affair, they merit swift assessment and intervention. And we should also be mindful as well that the means do not justify, the, the ends don't justify the means. Because they promise the speedy suppression of behaviour, but bark activated colours are sometimes quite uh, popular on social media and very popular with people who, who are put out an appeal to ask for ways, solutions to the fact that their dogs are going to be euthanised. But they don't change the dog's negative feelings towards the subject and often the barking recurs. So I don't think very many people are troubled by joyful barking or joyful fanfares like my neighbour behind me. Um, but certainly neighbours such as John's might disagree because John's dogs weren't always barking because they were upset or annoyed by people passing the property. Sometimes they were barking just because they were dogs and they enjoyed barking. Now, the police and the John's mayor were actually very sympathetic, but the neighbours had a point. Of course, in John's case, the mayor suggested very kindly to me that we get a bark collar for the dogs. I love it when non-experts make so-called helpful recommendations. He really thought he was doing for the best. So in Sylvia Masson's documentary research in 2018, they polled, without judgment, 1,251 dog guardians in France. They deliberately couched the language in non-judgmental ways so they could get a real insight into opinions on various types of shot collar. 
26% of guardians said they had used the shot collar. So of those 12, uh, 1,251, 149 had used the bark activated collar. So these were often used on hunt dogs or security dogs. I know that sounds a bit mad to use them on security dogs. Like, wouldn't it be a good idea if they barked? Isn't that the whole purpose? Like my girl Flicker, that barking is usually uh, all disturbances, but that's not easy if the dog's having to be housed on site or whenever the dogs are off duty, so to speak. So a lot of these were used on, on security dogs for those moments when they were supposed to be off duty, particularly, say for instance, my, my first adopted dog in France was a dog called Ralph, who'd been a guardian in a sawmill. And Ralph was in the office whilst the people were in there. And at night he would roam the sawmill, make sure no sawdust was stolen or whatever it was Ralph was doing there. But during the day, he was expected to be quiet. And obviously for Ralph, that was absolutely fine. I can't imagine Ralph bark very much at anything in the night. And he probably just had a really good night's sleep. But for dogs like Flicker, who'd also been involved in guarding warehouses and Toby, my other Malinois, they were often in situations where they just bark all of the time all day. So Flicker came to me having had seven guardians, having barked for 14 years of her life so frequently that she'd broken her bark. And in those cases, we might be thinking our history is very long. How can we possibly get a dog like this to reduce their barking, especially uh, and importantly to do so quickly because that barking is a symbol of distress for that dog. But there weren't global satisfactions with the bark activated collars and there were some problems with them so of those 149 people who used them 16 guardians actually reported injuries that included burning bark activated collars were only successful in 38 of those 149 that's 25 percent and they failed to make a difference or worsen things in three out of four cases and I think that tells us a lot that barking is strongly motivated behavior enough that punishment and shot collars don't make a difference Mr. Mayor was very surprised to hear that three quarters of the time bark collars were going to fail and 10% of the time they actually caused significant burning to the dog. The study also found that 68% of people who chosen to use a bark activated shock collar had done so because of complaints by their neighbours. So it is important that we understand why dogs bark as well as how to reduce it if it's inconvenient to our neighbours or if our neighbours find it excessive unlike my kindly neighbours who accepted my uh, well-guarded property. Because if we don't know how to reduce that barking, then we may become one of those people who decide to resort to shock collars in the hopes that it will work. And we need that res result quickly. Another 16% said that they'd anticipated their neighbours would find it annoying. So almost 80% of bark activated shock collars were used because we're concerned about our neighbours or because we're under pressure from them. Only 12% said that they themselves were annoyed by the barking. So many guardians reported that they'd seen an increase in negative emotions as well as fallout from the, the bark activated collars. So distress, fearfulness or behavioural depression as a result of the collar use. But this does give us a bit of an insight into the mayor's well-meant but less than helpful suggestion. John, by the way, was an, one of the number who had found that it actually made things worse. He'd already tried them and the barking had not decreased and his dogs were more distressed as a result and nothing had happened with the barking. So thankfully, he was also not one of the, hundred, the 16 people who noticed injuries or burning as a result of collars like this. And that's from the mouths of people who've used them. So when we understand the reasons behind behaviour, when we understand the triggers and the purpose of barking, then it's much easier to design programmes that can help reduce those unpleasant feelings that result in barking. I'm proof positive of that with Flicker and Heston. And although I never asked Heston to stifle his delicious barks of joy, why would anyone do that? I did help him find peace instead of barking out of frustration. And even though he spent the last 18 months of life surrounded by an enormous number of barkers in our neighbourhood, he was relaxed and calm throughout that. On the very odd occasion that he did bark, he stopped the moment I said thank you. I won't promise that that happened overnight, it didn't, but it did reduce very quickly once I knew how and where that would work. And it also involved different solutions for different kinds of barks. So even so, the barks of joy stayed. Who'd want to mess with that? It's not all problems, is it? That's for sure. Even though I know many of you will still be listening here 25 minutes in because you're looking for solutions. 
So that said, I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so just thinking about barking simply as like a communicative tool or a response to the world because barking fascinates me. It's a literal vocal language of dogs. Of course it fascinates me. I'm a linguist. So when we ask then why our dogs are barking, they could equally be doing other things. Barking is actually a very dog thing. Their wolf cousins don't bark as much, although they do vocalise in all kinds of different ways. I'm sure we're all familiar through television and films, at least if you've never heard it in person, I haven't, um, of hearing a wolf howl. But these are not the only sounds that canids and dogs make. Exhaling loudly, chuffing, that's blowing their air out of their cheeks, uh, sneezing, whining, whimpering, howling, chattering, growling, snarling and air snapping are all other ways that dogs can vocalise. And it can also be useful to think of other behaviours we would see in other similar situations. For instance, our dog barking at dogs out on the road might also whine and whimper. Heston used to do that. And that suggests a different why than growling or snarling. It can also help clue us in to what's the purpose behind those barks, as not all barks are created equal and not all of them are designed to do the same thing. Heston may well bark from time to time at dogs, but that often was preceded by whining. It's like, oh, I would like to go and say hello. If I'm thinking about the under, underlying emotions behind the whining, well, whining is in part an affiliative behaviour designed to convey pro-social behaviours and barking is often used by dogs to solicit the attention of another dog. Hey, I'm here. How are you? We see this in play, for example. So this is often seen, barking is often seen as a way that dogs can re-engage play in very specific circumstances. So when researchers have watched dogs play bowing, they noticed that they only did it when in view of the other dog, like the dog in, in the photo. And it was almost always followed by play restarting. So play bows for them were really kind of ding, ding, let's get the games restarted kind of behavior. But what's a dog to do when a p potential play fellow cannot see them? Well, you bark at them. So when dogs are in view of another dog, they play bow. But dogs don't play bow when their partner can't see them, they more frequently bark. Barking is also very much part of being a dog, but there are breed differences as well. So back in the 1960s, biologists John Paul Scott and John Fuller investigated the heritable qualities of dog behaviours across 500 dogs in five different breed groups. So they were looking at which behaviours can be passed on, essentially, and to what degree, how much. So their 20 years of research was very fruitful, but there's one tiny little detail that most people overlook. And that was that the gun dog breed that they chose, the American Cocker Spaniel, barked more than the ancient dog breed they chose to study, the Basenji. So they crossed litters of these two breeds and they also did cross fostering just to make sure that mum wasn't teaching the dogs to bark. So what they found, though, that was that barking had two heritable factors. Who knows, by the way, there could also be more. This was just like one piece of research. One factor that they found that could be inherited to varying degrees was how sensitive dogs are to triggers that might cause barking. So they tested the Spaniels and the Basenjis to see how long does it take them to bark at a stranger. Spaniels, of course, bark really quickly. Latency of barking simply means how quickly do the dogs bark in response to a trigger? How long between the dogs seeing the trigger and then the barking? And Spaniels had incredibly low latency. They were very fast. It didn't take much of a stranger to make them bark. And Basenjis on the opposite side had high latency. It took them much longer to start barking. And what Scott and Fuller found was that latency could be passed down lines of dogs, particularly from parents and grandparents. So when they bred Basenjis and, and American Cocker Spaniels together, what they found was that the offspring often barked somewhere in between, even when they cross fostered litters of uh, the puppies to either the Cocker Spaniel mom or to the Basenji mom. So they really looked at the, the influence there of genetics rather than learning from their moms. The other quality that could be passed on was duration, how long dogs bark for once they've seen the trigger. So Basenjis didn't bark for very long, often there would be two woofs. Cocker Spaniels, of course, you'll know this if you have a Cocker Spaniel, bark for ages. 
But there's so much we don't know about the heritability of vocalisation in general, though. But one thing is sure, if you want to understand one of the factors, one of the factors as to why your dog barks, it's sensible to look at the parents and grandparents. In response to the question of why do dogs bark? Well, in part because it's a vocalisation behaviour that has both a variety and heritable factors, meaning that it can be passed on in ways where evolution has shaped it to be more or less big or small in a number of ways. So where it's got adaptive value, where it's got purpose, where it can, be, where it's got variability and when it's got heritability, those three factors are the things that mean that it's likely to get passed on. Of course, barking isn't the only canine vocalisation with heritable factors. It is time for your headphones if you've got sensitive dogs, so stop now and grab them if you've been listening out loud, because you're about to see one other type of vocalisation that just might have heritable factors, which is baby huskies. So I'm pretty sure once you see this video, you're all going to be really glad that you don't have baby huskies. Now, I don't know if that's mum or not, but you can see why Scott and Fuller were interested in knowing whether mother was teaching the, hus the puppies to bark. Now, I've never lived with huskies, but that's not to say there aren't other dog breeds that who do yodel. Um, you know, I know a few dogs who do, beagles, bassets, uh, and other hounds who do love a good yodel from time to time. But if you wanted to place bets on which puppy would howl out of all the breeds who would yodel, then you'd have safer money on the husky or the beagle, if you ask me. Clearly, I have no scientific data to back this up, and nobody is running sweepstakes on which kind of puppies are likely to yodel if mum comes in to conduct some kind of weird science experiment. But lots of dogs vocalise in those kind of ways. And you're going to see another here, which is another headphones moment, which is a collie doing exactly the same thing. So when we watch this, just look how long it takes him to get going uh, when he hears the trigger. So the Huskies needed hardly anything to get them going. They had a uh, very low latency and it took it takes him longer. It's going to take this border collie uh, longer to start howling than it did for the Huskies. Um, but I'm pretty sure when collies are selected for agility, for sports or for working, a few people are kind of thinking, let's breed a quiet okay. collie or let's breed a noisy on collie. On Wednesdays, the siren goes off. And ever since those videos, I've seen nothing but dogs who are vocalising. All of my algorithms have gone mental. And now I'm getting loads of border collies who are singing and chorusing and yodeling and howling whenever anyone's playing the piano and golden retrievers that are howling at adverts. It's been ace. So I've had loads and loads more of those come up on my various video channel feeds. And probably vocal behaviours are just one of those things that hitched a ride when we were selecting for various working behaviours. It may even be that certain vocal behaviours were just useful to the dog and therefore useful to us. So for livestock guardian breeds, mastiffs and security dogs, for instance, it is kind of useful to have a hair trigger bark, you know, low latency, and also a dog bark that's pretty deep and sonorous. I'm not sure you'll know about the Italian mastiffs and Neapolitan mastiffs. I'm sure they've not been bred for their yodeling but their reputation as an Italian opera singer makes me laugh and here's a, an elderly lady that one of my friends had in Foster um, singing the song of her people <laughs> you can see why we're uh, classing them as Italian opera singers there 
some breeds of herding dog may also bark as part of their work. It's my impression that it's often the smaller herders who collect sheep or who work with recalcitrant sheep who have a kind of an adversarial role with sheep who might rely on barking. Although a lot of barking would clearly be seen as a fault, especially since it could startle the sheep. However, I do think it's more typical to find it in some herding dogs barking in anticipation or excitement or frustration um, as they're waiting to go out and do their, their work, as you'll see in this video of one of Pierre Legat's dogs collecting sheep. So when we think about herding breeds like New Zealand Huntaway, the Pumi, the Pyrenean Shepherd Dog, they will often bark as part of their work sometimes and some of that will be anticipation or frustration, but it all comes back to those genes. Job well done. So as you can see here, the Beauceron, it's my sneaky favourite breed by the way, is a pretty quiet herder. The older dog who's keeping up the rear here is doing one of her strongly inherited behaviours, that back and forth um, across the, the, the last sheep. She doesn't even bark when they go past other dogs who are barking, even though I think you'll hear that the younger dog yips once. Their triggers are very different and you'll be more likely to hear them bark in response to unfamiliar humans, dogs or potential threats approaching the flock because quite often they're left with the flock and they have a less adversarial role with the sheep so they don't often bark at the sheep in the same way because they're there as tending dogs to kind of guard the, dog, the sheep from threats so they're more likely to bark at a threat like you might find with a typical livestock breeding, uh, guarding dog. I hadn't noticed quite how many of those dogs are actually there with uh, an elder dog showing them how to dog, essentially. So when we think about why does this dog bark? Well, some of that is because barking is a behaviour that's it is possible to pass on and the more we've selected for specific breeds the more we've selected maybe purposefully maybe accidentally for barking or perhaps you know it's part of a suite of working behaviors so if you want a safe bet bet on me distinguishing between the ridiculously high-pitched single volley yip of a malinois compared to the deep throaty woo woo wooing of an alarmed german shepherd or a husky puppy yodeling uh, much more easily than a york a terrier pup for example so all of this makes more sense when we think about our dog's cousins the wolves so wolves do bark infrequently but they do bark for a long time people didn't think that wolves bark because it was really rare to hear them do so so there isn't one form of vocalization that dogs do that wolves don't barks howls growls yips whines whimpers snarls yelps and various combinations of the above Dogs do some more and wolves do some more than others and that's all. So as we've already seen, dogs may need less of a trigger to make some of these vocalizations and some wolves may need less of a trigger to make some. But that said, we don't have lots of information really about the wolf bark simply because wolves are very isolated and challenging to study. Perhaps the common ancestor of today's grey wolf and our modern dogs may have been much more vocal, who knows? They're only cousins after all, and we can't always tell about their ancestors' behaviour from the wolves and the dogs that we see now. But wolves definitely do bark, and if you do a search of wolves barking, you'll definitely find plenty of clips. Understanding when and why wolves bark helps us understand 
the purpose of dogs barking. So why and when do wolves bark? Well, those barks are usually when a person risks coming into the heart of the territory, usually where there are puppies in a den, especially around that den. So barking is a really good alert as well when the wolves are together in a pack and there are intruders, particularly when the wolves can't move away easily or when there are reasons for them to stand their ground. So it's a good way of getting the attention of the group, especially if you've not got very many options about moving away or you've got something valuable to guard in that spot. So sometimes we have to think about triggers. Those are the things that come before a behaviour. And sometimes we have to think about consequences, the things that happen after. And sometimes we have to think about both. So those triggers that come before the behaviour, before the barking, and a lot of barking, might actually be fairly involuntary, a bit like the collie with the siren, you know, you're just responding to the call of your people. They can be reflex-like, so they're not exactly a reflex, but they function in the same way. Lots of dogs fo uh, howl at sirens. It maybe awakens the call of the wild in them. Um, but we've been selecting for dogs more carefully for selected behaviours for about 3,000 years. And our dogs really, genetically speaking and time-wise, are really only a heartbeat away from wolves from an evolutionary perspective. And it is really the same with barking as it is with howling or yodeling. Beyond triggers and consequences, we also need to think about the emotional undercurrents. Is it joyful barking or aggrieved barking? Heston liked to do a fanfare as he went into the, bar the garden. Did that dog love to bark? It was like Rocky coming into the arena. Sometimes he'd just like bark for the joy of barking. He often barked out of excitement and anticipation and sometimes that tipped over into frustration. So some dogs bark in uncertainty, like, what is this thing? Almost like seeing if they get a reply from something unfamiliar. Headphones on again, as you are about to encounter a dog who is alarmed by a hedgehog. So this kind of alarm barking often feels fairly involuntary, especially where the dog is spooked and unable to control their responses. So as you've seen, there are plenty of triggers that can cause barking, and some of it is emotional response to the world understanding that which emotion underlies that behavior which causes that behavior which is causing a problem is actually important because that allows us to address those underlying emotions if our dog is struggling with them or experiencing them frequently so these barks are kind of involuntary reflex like barking can be a little bit tougher to work with in many ways because when we do it's actually about managing those triggers and reducing the dog's feelings about them so we're also involved in complex things like building up the dog's ability to cope with surprise and novelty. A lot of dogs, when they're surprised, like to bark. So shaping optimism might be a thing that we would do. And that's complex, you know, reducing pessimism, another complex thing to do. So it's not just a case of simply stopping the dog from barking um, like this dog will be doing with the hedgehog shortly. Um, because even if we punish the barking, the dog would still feel alarmed. And now the dog would also learn that feeling alarmed is actually worse because now it comes with a punishment as well. So if they connect us with that punishment or correction, then that could also undermine their trust in us too. So it's not necessarily about shock collars. It can simply about saying no or trying to stop the behavior in any kind of way. Um, shake cans and rattle cans and all kinds of water pistols are other ways that I know some of my clients have already trialed before they come to me um, to resolve their dog's barking that they haven't been able to reduce. So we'll see this, uh, that, as I said, funny dog barking. So sometimes that we encourage it, I think, because we're laughing at the dogs. Um, you'll see this, this dog barking at the poor hedgehog there. <laughs> Certainly better than getting a mouthful of prickles. But barking can also be influenced by consequences, what happens after the bark or what change the bark brings about. So, for instance, Heston's bark often sent strangers away from the garden. So his barking was reinforced by the fact that strangers went away. This was very, very true of that very aggravating post lady who needed telling every single day and every single day she kept coming back. This barking is sometimes superstitious, though, because what I mean by that is that the dog works under the assumption that the barking makes people and other dogs go away. I mean, they're not conscious of that, but that's the, that's what the behaviour thinks is happening. 
So Heston's barking didn't, for the most part, make people go away. They were going to go away on their own. And for people who were going to come in, they still came in anyway, despite the barking. So sure, it might have deterred the odd chancer who thought that my property wasn't very well guarded. He would have been mistaken. Uh, but on the whole, people's responses, their behaviours were not a consequence of what Heston did, of Heston's barking. So for that poor post lady and many delivery agents, it really doesn't make a difference. They were going on their way to do their job anyway. So the fact that they go away, though, makes them barking much more likely the next time because the dog connects that in their brain with the behaviour. And the next time the dog wants somebody to go away from their territory or their space, then barking is a solution that they've already found to a problem that they had. Barking can also be about the anticipation of the good stuff or even frustration when we can't get to it. I'm sure some of you have got dogs who like to let you know that a ball or a treat has gone under the sofa and they would really like it if you hurried up to go and get it out for them or to take them out for on a walk. Barking, like most vocalisation, is social behaviour. It's designed to change the behaviour of the group of, or another individual. So we can also ask, who's the barking directed at? Certainly alerting family members that they're in imminent danger may be one of those social functions. So if you remember the robot in Lost in Space, I quite often think that our dogs alert barking as something akin to danger, Will Robinson, danger, and that they're barking as a result just to kind of warn us as to what's going on. But it's no doubt that we in turn also influence our dogs barking. And when we think of cats, for instance, the cats in wild populations or who live outside of the human sphere, don't tend to meow very often but cats in the home are very reinforced by meowing because meowing gets more kinds of things so we can also be involved in those kind of relationships where we're actually rewarding the barking in that kind of way and and it becomes part and parcel of the things that help a dog communicate with us so it's often useful to think of other key consequences for dogs and there are four that we're going to think of the first is sensory stimulation. Does barking give dogs sensory stimulation? You know, I think there are definitely times when barking can be a lot of fun. If it's coupled with the zoomies or with movement or with playing or just the sheer joy of being alive, then it may well be part of our dog's way of finding pleasure in life and it's pleasurable in itself. So barking can be joyful for some dogs, I have absolutely no doubt. Having talked about cats meowing more in family homes, we can also talk about interaction. So we often describe this very negatively with dogs as demand barking or attention seeking. But it's fair to say that vocalisation can sometimes just be related to a desire to interact or that humans do things for dogs. In Scott and Fuller's work with those five dog breeds, many puppies barked and howled when separated from their mothers. And this seemed to peak somewhere between five to seven weeks, depending on the breed, and then decreased again. But it very much ties in with a developmental period where young puppies will experience a lot of anxiety upon separation. They've also passed a cognitive milestone with a process called object permanence during this time. So prior to four to five weeks when mum is absent, it's like, poof, she's just evaporated. She's not there. Um, around about five weeks, object permanence happens. And absence means to the dog that, well, she's somewhere else if she's not here. Of course, there's no point trying to get the attention of an individual who puffed into the air and, and simply evaporated. But puppies may whine, howl or cry more at this point because they're distressed. But also around five, five weeks, they start to understand that when mum isn't there, well, she has to be somewhere and vocalisation can be a good way to bring her back quickly. If every time mum returns, if you were howling and mum returns or you were barking and mum returns, then that's the kind of behaviour that can be rewarded. So we also have to think about developmental periods for our dogs. It's not a surprise that Heston's trigger started in his first fear period when, he'd, when his socialisation period was ending. And then on the onset of adolescence, he also started to bark when things became really lots of fun. And he started to bark at all of the animals and the crows and the all the things that were outside um, and just for the sheer joy of barking and those happened at developmental periods that coincided with a development of a fear period and then a development of adolescence. Dogs, of course, bark in play, as do wolves, but sometimes a bark can be that way. Some dogs have learned to engage others in play, including humans. 
We, of course, find dogs who are telling us that it's time for something. We've just become the dog's butler. But this can often be seen as frustration related to delayed access to the good stuff. So if your dog is barking at 4.59 to tell you that it's absolutely dinner time or the common time seems to be during the night, 3 a.m., that might be less about interaction or attention and more about frustrated waiting for things. This brings us neatly into our third type of consequence, which is access to resources or tangibles. I've known dogs who bark to get other dogs to move so that they can go and access their bed. One friend had a dog who'd stand and bark at any dog he wanted a space that access to. I'm sure we all know dogs who bark to get access to particular rooms or to the garden, for instance. We also know dogs who bark to let us know that they'd like us to do something for them, like fill the bowl or the water bowl or throw them a ball or have a game of tug. Baby Heston was very good at barking for a game of tug. And we sometimes frame this really negatively as well, saying it's demand barking or attention seeking rather than thinking of our dogs as having needs or also knowing how to gauge when those needs have actually been met and, are, and realizing that our dog is struggling to settle and that they're struggling with independence. If our dogs are barking because they want something, most of the time we can just ask ourselves, how can we better meet the needs of the dog? So, for instance, I used to play with baby Heston for a good hour or so before my online lessons so that he'd actually sleep then through the lessons. And I kept a tug toy under the table so that if he did wake up and he and I could play this silent game of tug, you could see me kind of jerking under the, the table like this, I think, some of my classes. But as he grew up, I like to think that he just felt more comfortable in his own skin and he didn't need that interaction as much. So he barked less at those kind of times and his barking gradually faded out. So it was very rare to hear him um, trying to get my attention or trying to interact with me whilst I was speaking to the computer. I think he acts as almost like a proxy person also he'd not learned actually that he needed to bark to get my attention he'd learned quieter behaviors got my attention so giving attention to those smaller less vocal behaviors if Keston came over I gave him my attention it was actually the easiest way to reduce barking that's designed to get our attention or to engage us to interact so if you brought me a toy I would play with it we also need to reward the small things with interaction as well. So say, for instance, we interact with dogs if they approach us or give us eye contact or bring a toy. And we should be mindful, though, that if we did ignore that behavior, then the barking is likely to return. You know, after all, if it's worked in the past, it will work again. So ignoring this kind of barking when they're barking at us is just about the best way I can think of to make barking really, really persistent and very noisy because it's very difficult to ignore such barking. We end up engaging with the dog anyway. So in those situations, I also was working on Heston settle and helping him feel calm and setting up the environment so that he was more likely to rest. So I would quite often feed him before my lessons and then he would just go to sleep and sleep all the way through. Quite often, I remember as he was uh, growing up that I had him on the couch right next to me when I was teaching my lessons so that if he needed me, I was right there. Um, but trying to help him learn independence and learn what to do and giving him chews and things like that so that he could actually keep himself entertained by himself was the best and biggest way to actually uh, stop him barking or interacting with me whilst I was distracted and trying to earn us some pennies. So the final consequence that might lead to barking is actually just escaping from something unpleasant. It makes the other person or individual go away. So we started with the dog who barks at strangers around the property. We can actually see if this makes strangers move away. It's actually a very favorable consequence for the dog. It brings relief. That feeling of being under threat goes away as long as you can make the others go away. So if the bad feelings stop as a consequence of barking, then that might be an important reason why a dog might be barking. So we've talked about triggers. We've talked about emotional responses to those triggers. We've talked about consequences and the four major types of consequences that happen as a result of barking. We haven't really talked, though, about the context, the situations in which barking might occur. So that can actually really help us pin down why our dogs are barking. If you've not noticed by now, newsflash people, dogs bark a lot. They bark in different ways to express different emotions and for all kinds of different purposes at different individuals individuals a bit like us really in our vocalizations but the context can also be really important for us if we're trying to understand why our dogs are barking and to devise solutions to that barking so in one study dogs barked for all kinds of different reasons just as wolves and coyotes did too 
Wolves are actually most likely to bark near their territory. So when the, you look at the videos of wolves barking, it's often when a person has disturbed them in their territory. So the context for the wolf is perhaps on home turf and maybe to alert others in the family to territory incursion. Wolf barking is also a neotenous behaviour. It's the behaviour of younger animals. Young wolves do it more than adult wolves. So some researchers suggest that dogs have retained quite a lot of juvenile features of wolves. So that kind of makes sense. Dogs bark in greeting. They may start to bark. They might start barking to start play. They can bark in defence and in threat. They can bark for contact. They can bark in pain. They can bark as a result of loneliness. They've got one favourite form of behaviour that works in a lot of different situations, which is kind of like the Swiss army knife of vocal behaviour. And as you saw from Heston, as I described him at the beginning, it was one tool that got lots of jobs done. You can see context here. I've got a puller on the floor and a dog who is clearly barking to say throw it. Once we've got context, a lot of barking makes more sense. Then we can start to think about whether our dogs are barking, whether that is troublesome or not. And sometimes it is, and that's fine. And other times it's not, and that's fine. I've not got an opinion on much other than I'm not a fan of listening to distressed dogs barking. So reducing barking very much depends on your circumstances and your feelings about it and the dog's feelings primordially. But on the other hand, having worked as a trustee in a shelter for six years, I know it's easier to remove dogs legally for noise pollution than virtually any other reason, including abuse. So I try to balance my dog's need to express themselves with my neighbour's need for calm cohabitation. I also remind myself of those 80% of people using bark activated shock collars, either because the neighbours had actually complained or because they thought their neighbours might complain. Our concerns often direct us to quick fixes. I like to think of, you know, my dog as a singing drunk. There are times when it's kind of cute and it gives you a smile. That time is not 2 a.m. when they're on their 37th rendition of Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. My neighbour's excited collie brings me a smile because he's so joyful and expressive. But I know there are other neighbours who view it as, you know, little more than a noisy 2am drunken encore when Elvis really should have left the building and gone home to bed. So I don't wake up easily from sleep and neither do my dog. So when that collie barks in the night, because sometimes he does, then I don't notice it unless I'm awake in the first place. But it's not something that wakes me up. But I do know that there are neighbours in the area who find it annoying because it disturbs their sleep and it's not just fear it can also be boredom so I often joke about my neighbours collies who started their serenade right before and there are two in different houses who bark I don't mind very much even the occasional 3am bark if I'm awake but I also suspect that sometimes those dogs are pretty bored and they're barking at things in the neighbourhood because they're a little frustrated seeing the world going by and not being able to interact or to control the movement of those people but they're also barking maybe for a set for their own stimulation one of them doesn't get walked very often and that's sad and so it's not a real surprise though that they're barking making their own fun hearing a dog with separation anxiety barking and loneliness for hours is clearly also very distressing but i don't think of a life of boredom being very much better when it comes to the welfare of our dogs and their barking so when we understand all of the reasons why our dogs bark, it makes it easier then to find solutions. And we may need different solutions for different barking. My boy Heston was sometimes the fun police and neighbourhood watch kind of barker, like, hey, there's something going on out there. But he was also sometimes an excited or frustrated barker when we were going out for a walk. And they needed different solutions. I'm not sure he ever understood that his barking was as much noise pollution as the individual making the noise that he was barking at. But giving him something to do might not have made much difference unless there were regular periods when neighbourhood noise was more likely. So this was one of the solutions that we had for John's dogs. The neighbour's meticulous diaries actually provided the solution because it, it showed us that there were, there were busy times when the dogs were responding to the neighbourhood comings and going, especially when the neighbour in question was deliberately being noisy to provoke them. So keeping those dogs in at those times, improving soundproofing in the house so that A, they couldn't be heard outside of the house and B, they couldn't hear noises inside. And we also removed their perches. They weren't able to look out through the window so that they couldn't survey the neighbourhood. That made all of the difference. We needed to change their routine just a little bit and, and also teach them to stop barking on cue. So we just did the, the same thing. 
I did the same thing with Heston. I know my post lady arrives between 12 and 12.30. In fact, all the other dogs in the neighborhood let me know that she's here. And then I would give some Heston something to do during that time. That really helped. So in fact, her arrival always meant the appearance of a very special, just for the occasion, squeaky rugby ball, his favorite toy. So he was actively listening for her arriving because it meant that the rugby ball would always come out. And so we actually paired that up so that he felt less bad about the post lady arriving. He was actually pleased that she had arrived and we used counter conditioning there to help him feel better. And we also helped him move away. Also, as it turns out, it's quite hard to bark with something in your mouth, but it's not impossible. But for John's dogs, extra activity at those sensitive times could really help. It can also help reduce their exposure to the triggers that cause it. So my sister's dog, Harry, likes to sit on the couch and bark at the neighbourhood comings and goings. So removing his perch, if that were annoying my sister, it doesn't, so she doesn't care, um, is important. So we can't all live in darkness. John couldn't, blocking out all noise stimuli. And some dogs can be particularly sensitive to that. And, you know, trying to stop our dogs being triggered by everything. So in that case, we will need to help our dogs get used to these triggers using a gradual scale to help habituate them to that. If you realise you have an alert barker who barks to let you know that there's something in the neighbourhood that's bothering them or offending them or something that you really ought to know about. Or if you've got an anxious alarm barker who's barking in response to the unfamiliar and the uncertain, you should find the alert and alarm barking protocol in the video description. It's simple. It requires very little other than consistency and good treats, and it really works. We come back to the notion that some barking is born of distress, and that's the kind of barking where a swift intervention can really help. It did Heston absolutely no good to spend all day on edge barking when a flea farted five villages over, especially as his health deteriorated. I didn't want him getting up and down and barking all the time. Frustrated barking, he had some of that as well, comes from that inability to tolerate frustration. So addressing frustration tolerance can certainly help reduce some problems too. And we know where there's a need for attention that's born out of loneliness and isolation. That's different. We should meet those needs. But that's different from a dog who barks because they just don't feel comfortable unless you're entertaining them and you're nothing more than the than Robbie Williams. Let, let, let you entertain them. So building up a dog's ability to be able to settle by themselves, find their own entertainment, to relax, to learn ways to occupy themselves and feel comfortable while you're doing so can be really important. Thanks very much for joining me today. I hope you found it useful. Don't forget to like the video. And if you'd like more content like this, let me know and share if you think that other people might find it useful as well.